welcome back to another episode on Genealogy TV. Today we are talking about immigration and naturalization, one of my favorite subjects. All right, so now before we get started, don't forget to subscribe and ring the bell so that you get notified each time we upload a video. Genealogy TV has a newsletter and a Facebook page. All of that information is in the show notes below. Now, I call this a footnotes episode because, well, it's in the footnotes where the real sources are. And today's real source is Margaret Fortier. She is a certified genealogist, making her second appearance on Genealogy TV. Previously, she had done an episode on Italian research. So if you're interested in researching your family from Italy, make sure you check out that. I will leave a link in the show notes. Well, okay, I think it's over here. Uh, I will put a little flag up there for you to find that episode. Now, we're going to jump right into it, talking about immigration and naturalization from wherever your immigrant ancestors may be coming from. Welcome back to Genealogy TV. I'm so glad you're back again. Thank you for joining us today. Tell us, we're here to learn about immigration and uh, I guess immigration and naturalization. Yes, two, two big topics for any genealogist, um, certainly in the US, but also around the world. Immigration is a big topic because people have been coming to America for 400 years by various means. We're mostly concerned with people who come by ship, but it's important to remember that many people came across the border. They came from Canada and they came from Mexico. Um, those records don't go back as far, but the ship's lists go back to 1820. Before that, there are scattered records of people coming by, but you really, can't count on finding someone before 1820. In immigration lists, the big thing you want to be aware of is that 1893 is a dividing line. Before 1893, the ship lists are very, very basic. They just have their name, where they came from, um, where they're going, and that they're a laborer. So they don't say anything about um, like where they're from or where they're going or anything like that. So if you find somebody before 1893, you probably have to find some other information to make sure it's them. Now the good news is that after 1893, things get much better. Um, and also the great mass of immigrants came after 1893. So um, chances are that you'll be able to deal with more information. And what you get in the later list is you get if they marry, you get um, where they last lived, you get who their relative was in the, uh, in the country that they came from. And if it's about 1907 or later, you'll get who in this country they are going to join. And it will often say, it's a husband, it's a cousin, it's a friend, and it gives you their address. And that's a great clue because now you have somebody else to research and you know, fit them into the family. So there's a, there's a lot involved in finding your, your ancestor on the ship. And one thing that people will often say is, well, you know, I can't find my ancestor because they changed their name. The, the inspector at Ellis Island changed the name when they came over. I'm here to tell you it is absolutely not true. This just persists um, in people's minds, but it, it is not true because the passenger list was created at the port they left at over in Europe or wherever they were. And obviously in their own country, people knew how to write their names down. When they got to Ellis Island or any other port, there were inspectors 
a third of the inspectors at Ellis Island were foreign born themselves. Most of them spoke a minimum of three languages. So you weren't dealing with somebody who didn't know, you know, the names. I did not know that. So the other thing is that um, many of the immigrants were illiterate. So if you ask them how to spell their name, they may not have been very accurate, may not really have known. So that's another, you know, possibility. Also, when they got here in the United States and they started working, lots of times their employers would simplify their names and they just decided, you know, it's just easier to go with this name rather than this, you know, complicated name. And they went with that. But it's not the case that they changed them at Ellis Island. Yeah, I have immigrants from Denmark and um, my Great grandmother's name was Francisca Amelia Cornelia Jensen. She became Francis Johnson. <laughs> <laughs> Talk about simplifying a name. Do you do you know offhand like the major ports that people may have been coming in? Uh, the major entry points, I guess. I know obviously Ellis Island and um, New Orleans. I guess is what I was trying to think. Yes, uh, New Orleans, particularly in the 18th century, um, was very popular because people would come to New Orleans and then they'd travel up the Mississippi, like to St. Louis or where or Chicago, mm -hmm. wherever they were going to go. Um, other important ports were Boston. Um, but don't assume that if you have people living in New England that they came into Boston, you have to check all ports because you don't know where they're coming in from. Um, and Philadelphia is another important That's point. right. Um, now, if they were coming in through Canada, where would they be coming in at, do you know? In, from Canada, there are various um, points across the border, um, but they were not recorded until 1895. Wow, you know, it seems awfully late, doesn't it? Yes, yes. It's because that it just, they weren't considered, uh, I guess it was because there were so many immigrants coming in on the ships that they, by contrast, there weren't so many coming across. And a lot of them were coming back and forth. You know, it was Americans going there and Canadians coming here. So they started taking, uh, taking notes on them in 1895. And those, those records are online. Well, I know that when they, when they switched, and this was probably a little bit earlier in time, I don't remember exactly the, the year that that started happening, but when they started switching from sail vessels to steamers, and that trip got cut down from six weeks to two weeks or 10 days, somewhere in there, that now they really started coming in um, and, and really kind of made a difference as far as the survival Mm -hmm. you know, people, people's survivability of the voyage across the ocean because uh, six weeks and disease and starvation and, uh, and storms and, you know, it was a, a different story when you were under sail. But when you started coming by steamship, um, yes. I know it, it became a much easier voyage. Right. Still and, probably not that easy, but. <laughs> no. And don't also overlook the fact that many immigrants from the British Isles came into Canada and then came across the border. So don't assume that even though they settled in the U.S. that they initially came here first because a lot of them came into Montreal. I know that a lot of, a lot of folks, once they immigrated, they either came, they were moving across, the migration patterns were either taking the Ohio River or up the Mississippi or whatever, and then started, you know, traveling west over time, you know, decades. Um, west on the Oregon Trail and, and the various trails that went west. But um, I find this whole subject really fascinating. I took a, a class at um, the Salt Lake Institute of Genealogy a few years ago on immigration, and I was just riveted the whole time. It was just fascinating. Everything from the types of jobs people found when they got here and Anyway, another thing I wanted to point out was uh, the terminology just for, especially people who are maybe new to genealogy, uh, 
immigration versus immigration, immigration versus immigration. Uh, because I know it makes a difference in the records. So maybe you could explain a little bit about that. Um, the immigrant is the person in Europe or wherever who's planning to come here. He's leaving. And they emigrate from that country and they immigrate to this country. And there are some record sets that will say emigrants with an E. But I think if you look on Ancestry, they just lump it all together as immigration. The 1890, the before 1893 manifests um, are really very, um, what would I say, informal. They don't have headings. Um, on the slide, I have put the headings in red. Um, and they're always handwritten and they just look like they're scribbled. Um, some of them are not in great shape, so they may not be, they may be cut off or blot, you know, blotchy or whatever. So um, you do need to um, be careful when you're dealing with them. After 1893, it's much better and you get if you get um, maybe 1920 or beyond, you can even get typewritten lists, which is fabulous um, because then at least you know what letter they intended to put down, not that it's always written correctly. Now, do you think those typewritten lists are uh, indexes that were created after the fact? No, the typewritten lists were created at, at the time. Okay. They were. I think they just realized, oh, it can be. It will be much faster, and it'll be much easier to to type them. Um, although some of them are are in very good handwriting, but then of course you get the others where you're, you know, enlarging it ten times, and you're still trying to figure out what it says. Yeah, uh, I was just trying to decide whether that was a primary source or a secondary source if it's typewritten. So, um, but that's good to know that they were probably typed at the time of the, of the voyage, which uh, is important. Yes, yes. And you can get a lot of clues too, because if somebody says that the person that they left behind is um, their wife, then you have a clue, well, let's look ahead and see if she came over a few years after he came over which, you know, may or may not happen. Sometimes they will say that their nearest relative is their father. That usually means that they're not married because otherwise they would say the spouse. And if they say it's their mother, you can probably bet that their father has died and their mother is their closest relative. So there's lots of little clues you can get from all of this, you know, and how much money they have, um, it also asks whether they've been in the United States before, and it will specify when and for how long. So if you find that, then you have the information to go back and find them when they came even earlier. I always find it interesting that even on census records, you know, when it says ha are you, the ability to read or write, that, that's always blown my mind every time I see it. I know, I know. I, I saw a statistic that said, uh, in 1897, when Russia took a, cen a census, less than 30% of the population was literate. And that's, I mean, that's practically 1900. I mean, that's just incredible. That is incredible. Yeah. So I, I see here on the, on the, the uh, slide that you've also got who paid for the passage, which I think is always a great... Um, piece of data because it's usually a family member. Yes. Yes. Or a very close friend, but usually someone who's related somewhere along the way. And the amount of money they carried, um, you know. Some of those folks landed with nothing. Yes. You know, you wonder, what did they do? Get off the boat and go sleep on the curb? <laughs> I <don't know. laughs> <laughs> Although a lot of people had, uh, you know, someone picking them up or, you know, had, uh, you know, some sort of connection with that chain migration. Well, that's something else we should talk about. Explain for those who might not understand what chain migration is, uh, what that is. Uh, chain migration, or sometimes it's called family migration, is a situation where one person from the village 
comes over to the United States and establishes themselves. As soon as they're established, they are sending money home for the rest of their family to come over. And, and then that becomes the extended family. So that each, so if you, you know, if you trace it, you see a link between the initial person, then they bring the brother over, then the brother brings the wife over, then the wife brings her parents over, and you can just see it's all connected. And the great thing about that is, is if all you need to find is one person in that chain that tells you the birthplace, and now you know where all of them are born. So that's, that's also another reason to research the whole family um, because you're not going to find everything you want just looking for one person. And sometimes you can find uh, that uh, the same person who originally came over to get established goes back. You can find the records going back and then they come back again. Mm -hmm. Or uh, sometimes there is a long time span in between. So it could be a decade sometimes before he gets enough money to get his wife and children over or, you know, something along those lines or, right. you know, a variety of cir circumstances. But there's often a couple of years in between. Uh, mm -hmm. Can you imagine? I mean, nowadays we can just text across the world, I right? <laughs> but they, they might not, you know, how do they? A letter, hope it gets there, you know. <laughs> yeah. It could take months to just get a handwritten letter overseas. Starting in 1906, the passenger list would specify the birthplace of the immigrant. So, okay. um, and that's great if you're looking for the, you know, their place of origin. So now you know, because now you know that person, but also everyone in, the, in that person's family. And in 1907, the, the name and address of the closest relative. I know you had mentioned that before, but I don't know that I had clued in on the dates. Um, so that's, again, late in time, you know, yeah. that's just 110 years ago, 112 years ago. This is... Vittore Yaniti, who is arriving in New York, and he's, um, he's 25. He was a farm, he is a farm laborer, although it's uh, likely he's probably just a laborer over here, because I don't know there's too many farms uh, in 1922 in Providence. Um, He's literate, he can read and write. And the last place he lived was a place called Minturno in Italy. And his closest relative is Caterina Conte, his wife. And if you notice, her surname is not the same as his. And that's because Italian women kept their surname throughout their lives. So when she eventually, if she eventually, comes over to the United States, she will be listed excuse me, as Katerina Conte, not as Katerina uh, Iannidi. I love it, love it, love it. So, um, and he's going to Providence, Rhode Island. Now here's a case of somebody, you would think, well, why wouldn't he come into Boston? But he came into New York. So um, that's why you have to check all the ports unless you absolutely know they came into a particular port. Wonderful. Let's and there's see. another page which tells you all kinds of interesting things. Um, tells you that he bought the ticket himself. He has $25, so you know he's not destitute, but he doesn't have a ton of money. He hasn't been in the United States before. And he's going to his brother, Berardo, who's living at Pelham Street in Providence. And he, uh, what's the five years? He's, oh, he's planning to stay for five years. That's kind of interesting. Um, you'd have to, you know, look at a census going forward to see if he was still there. And it gives you a description of him. He's 5'5", five five. he has a brown, brown eyes and hair and a dark complexion and his birthplace is Minturno. Oftentimes the last residence is the birthplace, but not always. So you always have to look at it. 
Great stuff. So if someone uh, is going to start researching uh, immigration, let's say they've discovered they've got family uh, across the pond, where do they, where do they start? Uh, you can start with uh, Family Search, which is free, um, and look in their immigration uh, records, or you can search Ancestry Immigration Records. Um, and you don't need to have a personal subscription because many, many libraries have the library edition and you can go in and look that way. Um, and if you just go in and look under immigration and do a really broad search, um, that's, that's the way to start. One of the things that I like to do when I'm searching for immigration records is I like to go up to the, uh, and I'll just go through this again. I like to go to the card catalog. <laughs> <laughs> I like to go to the card catalog and I like to drill it down, in this case, the, the United States, and then I'll pick the records for immigration and uh, travel. And it gives you the whole list of everything in the world mm -hmm. of immigration. Now, if you happen to know where they came in at, you could, you could drill it into a specific uh, port or whatever, but you can also look at now, I just drilled it into immigration and travel, so that still includes all of these mm -hmm. record sets, um, which is one of my favorite ways to do it. You can also do that on Family Search. It's a little bit different uh, yes. Yes. Uh, in how you go about getting to it. I will search records, and then the way I do it, I always search by location first. I don't mm -hmm just pop my guy's name in there. I will go and I will look at the United States restrict records by type. And here it is immigration and naturalization. And then you can search and you can filter right. down that way. And mm -hmm. then you can pop over to collections. This is kind of a cool uh, feature of family search. Cause you yeah, I love that records and collections. And I almost always go to collections because I want to, I want to be very methodical in how I'm researching mm -hmm. instead of, just searching all records, which might give me, you know, I'm Vermont or something that I know is not part of the group that I want to look for. I, I just want to look in a certain year or a certain set of records and you can dial it down even further. My personal preferences, I typically start on Ancestry, but I have a subscription there. I do know, you know, like you said, that it is, it is free on family search and you can do some research on Ancestry at the, at the public libraries for sure you want to find out if they became a citizen once they got here. I mean, sometimes you know because they have a certificate or something like that, but other times you're not really sure. So how do you find out if they really became a citizen? Well, there's a couple of ways. You can look at the censuses because they will say whether they became a citizen and it will tell you the year. Um, sometimes you get people who one year they're a citizen and I mean in the next census year they're not so obviously you need to research a little bit more if they showed up in the world war one draft records in 1917 and 1918 that included all a all men between certain ages whether they're alien or citizen so that will tell you if they were in the country and if they were a citizen at that time or if they were an alien at that time good tip you also want to look at um, voter records if you have them. And some localities will have a resident list which will specify if somebody is a citizen or not. They're a little bit um, more intense to get into because you have to know where they lived, but that can be a really good source. Um, and the other thing to look at is if they were a witness in somebody else's naturalization. Let's say you have a cousin and you have his naturalization and you see, oh, this person was a witness to his um, procedure. Well, that means he's a citizen because you couldn't be a witness unless you were a citizen. So that's kind of like a little back door into it. Um, many immigrants came here in the early 1900s and did not see a need to naturalize until World War II. Because in World War II, the government said, okay, anybody who's an alien, you have to register at the post office every year. 
And some of them said, well, you know what, maybe I will become a citizen at this point because it's a pain to go to the post office and I've been a good American all these years. So you will see uh, people um, become citizens later in life because of that um, push by the government. Now, there was a process to become naturalized. Uh, do you want to talk about that? Yes. Usually, um, somebody had to uh, take out what they called first papers, which was a declaration of intent. Um, and you just said, you know, I'm planning to become a citizen. And um, then the law for most of the period would say you'd have to wait five years until you bec could become a citizen. And then you would petition for naturalization. You would have your two witnesses. It would be a court proceeding. And at that time, if it was after 1906, if you wanted to change your name, you could do it at the same time you naturalized. So there are some people who did it that way. Now the tricky thing, one of the very tricky things about naturalization papers is that you could file those papers in different courts. You could file your petition in Luzerne County, Pennsylvania, and you could file your declaration in Boston, Massachusetts. So, and the declaration will reference the petition, but if you don't have the declaration and you don't know where they were, you can be looking in a lot of places. Do you think that uh, immigrants could get away without ever becoming naturalized? Sure, sure. There was no requirement to become a citizen unless you wanted to vote. I mean, there were some specific things that different localities um, limited, but no, there was no requirement to become a citizen. The other thing is that before 1906, the whole naturalization process was um, handled by all different courts. Supreme Court, state court, county court, city court, police court, all of them could naturalize somebody. They had all different forms and they were supposed to follow the law. But if somebody came in and they said, how long have you been living here? Have you lived here, you know, X amount of time? That person may not have been truthful and they may still have become a citizen. So, um, it can be on both ends, you know, you just, you just don't know. And there's also all kinds of um, kind of exceptions, you know, if you're a child of somebody who becomes naturalized, then you are naturalized. There's no record of it. There is, there is nothing whatsoever, but by the fact of your father becoming naturalized, you would become a naturalized citizen. And the same thing for your wife, up until a certain point in time. So I have to share this resource. I found this uh, when I was doing my uh, Danish uh, immigration research. I found this website called Heritage Ships. Now, uh, I'll share my screen here so you can see it, but believe it or not, you actually have to pay for these uh, images, but they're kind of cool. Um, mm. And you can go down, so how I found this website was I was looking for, on the, on the immigration manifest that said who the company was, the ship that my Danish ancestors came in on, and the name of the ship was the Geyser, I think it was what it was called, and it was, it was Thing Valia Line. I'm not exactly sure what that means or if I even <laughs> said it right. But, so you could look it up by line. Um, oh, look, some Italian, since I know you're uh, doing Italian research. But so I'm going to jump over to the thing volume uh, line, if I'm saying that right. And these are the ships that came from Denmark. And so you can click through and actually see the images. And let me see if I can get this to open up even bigger. I don't know if it, if it will. Oh, wow. This is kind of a low resolution image, but you can actually buy a high resolution image of the different ships. Um, which is kind of cool. 
Yes. Um, and it's got everything from steamer ships to whatever. And so you can, you can actually download a really high resolution. Some of them are drawings. Some of them are actual images, especially, you know, when photography came around. But they do have on this website, and I've really zoomed in quite a bit, but they do have um, some of them. Some of them I found they allow you to use for free as long as you leave the watermark on them. And so make sure that you're checking uh, the usage if you're downloading a free version, but usually they're about this size. They're not much larger than that. So when you're doing your immigration research, if you find out what ship they came in on, it just kind of makes it a little more exciting to be able to go, oh, that's the actual ship they came in on. That particular ship ended up sinking about uh, a month after my, uh, it says it collided in 1888, the geyser collided with another ship anyway. So <laughs> oh, it was like, whoa, that even made a story in itself because my folks had just come over not long before on that very same ship. So anyway, apparently it was a big disaster. 105 people were lost in that, oh. um, in that oh. accident. But anyway, I will let you continue now with, <laughs> <laughs> with your agenda here. Sometimes when you get um if you find a record there are some really cool i haven't found it in my own family yet but i i have seen some pa uh, like passports with images and some really cool stuff in some of those immigration records yeah if you find a passport that's that's really um really helpful they tend to be um only certain time periods i mean unless you unless you have one, you know, from your ancestor. Uh, but if you have them, it's got everything you need, which is great. Um, and Ancestry does have um, a list of passport applications going up to about uh, 1925. The other thing with manifest, ship manifests, is to always look if they, if, you're, if, you, if you find the immigrant's name and they're crossed out, you want to look for a notation that they were held for special inquiry. And it's either an SI or a BSI, and you want to look further in the manifest, um, you know, just page through to the end, and there'll be a page on what happened to them. And they would hold people when they thought they would be a public charge. And uh, so this would happen with children um, that weren't with their parents, They'd hold them to be sure that somebody came and picked them up, or if there was somebody that they thought there was a public charge, or if there was somebody that they thought was uh, an unsavory character or not somebody that they wanted, they would hold them for special inquiry, and they would note how many meals they had, and um, then they would note when they were released. Usually they were picked up. Most of them were picked up, but sometimes there were hearings and other things. So... Um, so you want, you always want to look further. Well, know. I know that some people were held if they didn't have enough money on them too. Um, yes. And I think they had, I don't remember what it was, but I believe they had to have a minimum amount of money, uh, so that they weren't begging on the streets, I guess. Yes. Uh, they, yeah, that, that was true. Um, and that was related to not wanting them to be a public charge. Uh, there were also some interesting cases of um, young couples who emigrated together because they couldn't get married in their home country because their parents didn't approve. And there are actually some weddings at Ellis Island as a result of that. <laughs> Which no is way. That's amazing. Yes. Yes. That is so cute. Yeah. <laughs> I was looking at, I had just looked up on Ancestry real quick. Uh, I keyworded the word passport because I was curious. You said that they ended in 1925. And I do see passport application from 1795 to 1925. So that's a good 130 years. Right. And there's other, there are other passport uh, record groups here as well. Mm -hmm. um, but that's the one that caught my eye because that has over almost 3 million records in it. That's the big group. The other thing to think to, to be aware of is that some people only got halfway through the process. They took out first papers and they never completed it. 
but if you at least find the first papers, that gives you another clue about, you know, where they were and what they were doing and all of that. Um, I had an interesting um, situation. I, I went to um, Salt Lake Institute this January and took a course on immigration after 1890 with Rich Venezia, which was fascinating. Um, and I came home and realized my father was born in Italy. He, um, he joined the service during World War II and he was naturalized uh, through the service because they had a special deal where, you know, you didn't have to wait five years. They figured if you're willing to put your life on the line for the, con for the country, then I guess we'll make you a citizen. But I, you know, I had gone through Rich's stuff and kind of like understood it a lot more. And I'm thinking, well, wait a minute. My father came here when he was 16 to join his father, who was already a citizen. So why did he have to become a citizen? You know, <laughs> I mean, he was a, uh, under 18. He was a child. Why wouldn't he become a citizen? And I found out it was because there was a law that was passed maybe two years before he came that said if you came over and you were above a certain age, you had to wait five years to become a citizen. So my father actually applied for citizenship in Boston, then went in the army and became a citizen because his unit went from California to Mexico and back in the same day that was re-entering the country and became a citizen. <laughs> so, hmm. yeah, that's what they did. Wow. I know. So you, uh, you can always learn something. <laughs> well, and, you know, and I'm sure for every rule, there's a broken one, too, that somehow someone got around it or got right. special favoritism for one reason or another. You know, uh, there's a book. I don't know if you're familiar. Uh, when you said you had gone to SLIG, mm -hmm. Salt Lake Institute of Genealogy, uh, and did an immigration course. I had done one a couple years ago with John Coletta. Mm -hmm. And he's got a book called They Came in Ships. Yes. And um, I don't know if you've read it, but... Yes, I have it. <laughs> it's, it's a good little paperback, yes. and uh, it's, a, it's a fun read. Um, and he is the one that I took the course from. And it's funny because I took the course and didn't realize I had already read his book. I didn't realize, I just didn't put two and two together. And so kept, as I'm taking that class, I'm going, gosh, the name sounds familiar. <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> I have your book. I read your book. <laughs> <laughs> um, but uh, he he was really entertaining. Uh, with yes, he's um, a wonderful lecturer. He's very good. Any other uh, reference materials that people might want to know about? I actually had um, some references, and one of them was John Coletta's. But the other one is uh, the so they became Americans by Loretto Dennis Zooks, which is um, all about. Um, the naturalization process in the United States. Wonderful. I will put a link to that in the show notes below, as well as uh, Dr. Coletta's They Came in Ships book. Um, <laughs> yes, I've thumbed through mine several times. I don't have a copy of that book, though, so I'm going to have to get a copy of that one. People want to find you. How do they go about doing that? I am <clears throat> listed on the Association of Professional Genealogists, um, APG apgen.org, I believe. Um, and right when you go online, it will, there'll be a little tab for the directory. You just put in my name and you'll get all my stuff. <laughs> Wonderful. Well, I really appreciate you giving us some insight into uh, immigration and naturalization records and, and the whole process and the laws and the little nuances of, of finding our immigrant ancestors. They're out there. You just have to dig. Well, I love this stuff. <laughs> Special thanks to Margaret Fortier uh, for her time and sharing her experience with us about immigration and naturalization records and all the tips and tricks. And, well, she gave us a lot of little tidbits of information we may not have known before. So thank you so much. There are links for everything we talked about in the show notes below, the books and some of the resources that we talked about. Don't forget to subscribe and ring the bell so that you get notified each time we upload a video. Also, don't forget to get hooked up with the newsletter and the Facebook page. 
Until next time, keep on climbing your family tree.